I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I've been there for six years. Um, and I'm going to tell you about some of our work on distributionally robust optimization. But this, is, this talk is basically a tutorial to introduce you to the, to the concepts. I'm assuming that you don't have a background in this at all. Um, and we'll sort of start from the basics. I know actually several of you have come up to me and said you do research in this area. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be a balance between the folks who haven't seen this at all and, and there will be some, some new nuggets for the, the people who um, are working with this in their work. So um, my area of research is actually more focused on control in power systems and control of distributed energy resources. I have a background in control systems um, and I apply that to power systems research. I got involved in this project because we were interested in um, understanding how you could schedule uncertain resources like distributed energy resources to provide services to power systems when um, the services that they provide are less certain than the services provided by generators. So if, you're, if you have a background in power systems, you know about ancillary services, frequency regulation, um, reserves, things like that. Um, distributed energy resources can provide these types of services, but they don't do it as well as generators do. Um, so there's this extra uncertainty added. So we were looking at formulating optimization problems um, that would leverage these resources, and then we found distributionally robust optimization, which ended up being an interesting technique for us to apply. But I'll also talk today about how um, it, has, it has its limitations. It doesn't always work for the sorts of problems we're trying to solve, especially very large-scale problems. It doesn't, at least currently, um, it doesn't scale particularly well depending on the reformulation. Okay, so I'm coming at this from sort of the application standpoint. We had an application, we looked for this tool. Um, my background is not in optimization, but hopefully I'll teach you enough so that you understand how to use this for your application. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, thank my students. So <laughs> Bowen Lee, Dr. now he's Dr. Bowen Lee. He just graduated. He was one of my first PhD students. He's now a postdoc at Argonne National Lab in Georgia Tech. Um, most of this work is based on his PhD dissertation, so I'll show you today some of the results that we generated. Um, and he actually also helped me with the exercise that you're going to do at the end, um, which is to code a simple distributionally robust optimization problem. You're not going to do the entire code here. Actually, I have it. we have it all basically written for you, where we remove some of the parts of the code, um, and you'll use what we talk about in the lecture to um, add some constraints and so forth and then run the program and get a feel for what these problems look like. Okay, so we're going to do that after the lecture. So um, Jalal had told you yesterday I wasn't going to share my slides, so I changed my mind. <laughs> I shared my slides, they're online. There's also three pieces of code that you're going to download. Um, the reason I usually don't share my slides when I lecture is because I want you to be sort of with me as opposed to in the computer. Um, and I tend to ask a lot of questions uh, so we have more of a back and forth. So I would encourage you to sort of Pay attention as opposed to reading the papers and, and the various things that are posted online. But during the talk, I'll talk about what those things are that are posted and how you'll leverage, leverage them later. Okay, I only have 19 slides. This shouldn't take forever. Um, but if you have questions throughout, just feel free to stop me and ask any questions that you have. Okay. Um, so just taking a step back. Um, so there's a, we're talking a lot about uncertainty in electric power systems these days. Um, we've always had a lot of uncertainty, and we tend to deal with it just by having a lot of redundancy in the system. There's always one uncertainty because you can't forecast the loads perfectly. And now we have problems where there's additionally renewable, a lot of renewable energy in the system that we can't forecast perfectly. So yesterday, Munther painted a, a bleak picture of the U.S. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, renewable energy for you all. I don't think it's quite as bleak as what he painted. It's, it's, there is... We are working on putting renewable energy in. We're probably not moving as fast as some um, countries in Europe. But some states in the US are actually moving quite fast. And some of them have very aggressive renewable portfolio standards, which is our way of encouraging renewable investment. For instance, Hawaii is trying to get to 100% renewables, and so is Vermont. So it's coming. And in certain parts of the US, they're already facing significant challenges in operating power systems with high penetrations of renewable energy, especially wind power. Um, so this is causing a lot of problems where we need additional balancing reserves, so backup capacity to be able to respond to um, forecast errors. Uh, there's also uncertainty that's always existed because of equipment failures. So in that case, you have to plan also for um, backup capacity to compensate for a large generator or a line that goes down, and then you have a, a change in power flow. Um, today, I'll primarily be talking about how to use distributionally <laughs> robust optimization for the first category of providing balancing reserves. Um, but there is some work also on using similar techniques for uh, equipment failures. It's just kind of a different type of uncertainty in the system. A shock to the system versus a constant balancing problem. So traditionally, um, we choose the amount of reserves we need in the system 
just based on historical experience. So you might have some data about what worked and what didn't work in the past. Um, power system operators just have a feel for how much you need. They tend to be very conservative um, because they want to make sure that the lights stay on. Um, and in the US, the entities that are organizing this are independent system operators, which is a little bit like the RTOs here. Um, and the market operators all wrapped it up into one. Uh, and their primary goal is reliability. Um, they also run the markets, um, but their secondary goal is economics. So they'll always make decisions to make sure the lights stay on above making sure the system is economically um, optimal. So they're very conservative, uh, and they use rules of thumb and, and just basic um, rules to determine reserves. Like there's one rule that people talk a lot about, the three plus five rules. So you take 3% um, of the load and 5% of the renewable generation forecast, and that's the total amount of reserves that you back your system up with. So these types of rules are commonly applied. So we want to do this in a more intelligent way. So there's been a lot of research focused on um, understanding how you could formulate the dispatch problems using stochastic optimization. But as of now, in the US, these are not applied in practice. Um, a lot of times now we're using these in sort of a research setting, and it's allowing us to come up with better rules of thumb and heuristics to apply in practice. But right now, they're not solving uh, stochastic power flow problems. Um, so people have proposed stochastic unit commitment, stochastic optimal power flow, and stochastic economic dispatch. Where I'm defining economic dispatch, um, which I realize I've spelled wrong right there, uh, as the, it's the dispatch problem where you don't embed the power flow equations. So the state of the art in the US, the, the power system operators are solving um, a, a unit commitment problem and an optimal power flow problem actually embedding um, the power flow constraints into the problem and co-optimizing with reserve dispatch, um, which as I understand it, at least according to my knowledge from five years ago when I was, or six years ago when I was in Switzerland, um, was not what's being done here. Usually the reserve problem is solved separately. Is that still true for us? <coughs> solved separately from the, 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 the energy dispatch problem. So the optimization problems that are being solved are very large, very complex, and they're supposed to achieve optimal results. And if you can add uncertainty into those problems and plan for it, you can do better. So one approach that people have looked at in the past is this multi-stage stochastic optimization, where you take a bunch of uncertainty scenarios. So you say you have um, scenarios for different load forecasts and different uh, wind and solar forecasts. And you just determine first stage decision variables, for instance, the dispatch of all the generators, um, while minimizing the expected cost of the dispatch over a variety of different, over all of the scenarios. So the idea there um, is that you're choosing the decisions you have to make now <laughs> while ensuring that the decisions that you're going to have to make in real time to respond to forecast error are feasible and also optimal in an expectation sense. So this is a common approach. Um, an issue with this approach is this. So what happens um, when the real time thing that arises in terms of the wind or the, 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 the load doesn't match any of the scenarios that you've planned for? Have you seen this? What happens if you solve this type of problem? Where is this? Is the microphone? Okay, I wasn't listening when he was talking about this. So I give you this. <laughs> so it might affect the feasibility of the solution. Yeah. You say. Yeah. True. And was there another hand? Or you wanna? You guys can throw it out. Right. So if a, a scenario you didn't plan for arises, um, yeah, we'll just leave that there. Then you might not have a feasible solution. And you certainly won't have an optimal solution because you didn't plan for it. And, and another problem is you don't necessarily know how to respond to that specific scenario because you created um, different responses for all possible scenarios that you tested against. But if a new one comes, you don't know what to do. You don't have a policy to respond. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, one of the drawbacks of the traditional version of this type of approach. So there's another approach. Um, it's not directly comparable. It's sort of trying to solve a different type of problem. But again, it's handling uncertainty. And the goal here is to obtain the lowest cost solution that satisfies uh, constraints at high probability. So this is chance constraint optimization. How many of you are familiar with chance constraint optimization? About half. OK. OK, so the goal here is to reformulate your constraints. So uh, the, the constraints on the inside here, f of x, Somebody is Greek who knows how to say this thing. C. C? Yep. <laughs> um, f of x c is less than or equal to zero. So that's the constraint you want to uh, satisfy 
So the probability of that constraint being satisfied should be greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so in this case, x is the decision variable vector, c is the vector of random variables, epsilon is a uh, probab uh, uh, violation probability. So usually you set that to be very small so that that constraint holds at a very high probability. So say for 95% of the instances, this constraint would hold. If you chose 95%, then epsilon would be 5%. Okay. So this type of optimization, you're not minimizing expected costs. You're minimizing a cost, which is deterministic. You really care about feasibility of the solution. So your solution has to be feasible for some percentage of instances of the uncertain constraints. Um, and so I would think of the previous version as trying to achieve economic optimality. That's more important. This one's trying to achieve feasibility. That's more important and might be more costly. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on applying chance constraint optimization to optimal power flow um, going back 20 years or so. Um, but there's been a lot of work recently in the last 10 trying to formulate the right types of problems um, and find solutions that are tractable. There's work here. Um, incorporating the AC power flow equations. A lot of the traditional work in this space has used the DC power flow equations because they're linear. So you can end up solving, pro uh, formulating problems that are solvable. If you incorporate the AC power flow equations, it's very hard to get an exact solution to this problem because the AC power flow equations are non-convex not linear. Um, and in addition, uh, some folks have figured out to also incorporate real-time control policies for responding to forecast error, not just wind forecast error, but also it could be load forecast error, but basically mismatch between supply and demand. And the nice thing about these approaches is then you plan for a set of uncertainty, um, but then if something arises that you didn't explicitly plan for, you still have a control policy that says, for this uncertainty, respond in this way. So it somewhat takes care of that problem that I told you about before, where um, before if a scenario arose that you didn't plan for, you didn't know what to do, you might have to solve another problem in real time to figure out the best response given the dispatch that you have. Here, you have this policy that says, given this that you've seen, this realization that you've seen in terms of the uncertainty, this is the control action you should take. Okay? So even if you don't plan for a specific scenario um, that you've optimized over, then uh, you still might have a response to that scenario. Um, so that's been a benefit of this. So the, the problem is when you have optimization problems with constraints like this, you can't explicitly solve that problem. You have to reformulate it in some way. You can't stick a constraint like this in a solver directly. Maybe there's new solvers that will reformulate it for you. But in any case, the solver has to do some reformulation to solve the problem. So a traditional way to solve a chance constraint problem is to do an analytical reformulation. So if, if you make certain assumptions about the constraints and the uncertainty, um, then you can often analytically reformulate the constraints as deterministic constraints and then solve the problem. So the shape that those constraints take depends on what that constraint looks like and what assumptions you make about the uncertainty. So for example, there's been some papers that assume um, wind power forecast error is Gaussian. Um, this epsilon is small. And that's a, that's, so that one's a very good assumption. Usually you want the constraints to hold at a very high probability. So epsilon is very small. So that's a very fair assumption. But assuming forecast error is Gaussian may be less good of an assumption. Um, and then what you can do is reformulate this problem and the resulting constraint is a convex second order cone constraint and then you're, you have a second order cone problem and there are solvers like we heard about yesterday. Um, Mosaic can solve these very efficiently. <laughs> so then you can solve these problems. But the problem is that we know that the forecast error isn't perfectly Gaussian. Um, now this is in the power systems community, you may have been to conferences where we talk about this a lot because it might be a good assumption under certain situations. It might not be terrible. There might be ways to make this assumption, but then make your problem a little bit more conservative in another dimension so it's an okay assumption to make. But in general, we know that it's not perfectly Gaussian, so it'd be nice to not have to force it to be, but instead to use data samples to estimate what it actually is or to get some sense for what distributions would be a better fit. Um, so, and it also is the case that even if you have a bunch of samples and you're trying to estimate a distribution, that uh, get, getting the actual distribution isn't possible. And distributions aren't physical things anyway. <laughs> distributions are our own models. They're in our heads, right? Um, they, and, and if we fit the best distribution, that distribution is also going to change over time. But the samples aren't actually being drawn from something, something called a distribution. It's just nature, <laughs> right? So you know, we can talk about actual distributions, and usually when we talk about actual distributions, it's still the model that's the closest fit to the data. It's not an actual distribution. 
Um, so, and, and importantly, when we have tried this approach for certain, um, in certain cases, we find that if we assume errors are Gaussian, uh, that the that we get solutions that don't satisfy the constraint satisfaction um, threshold properly. So that means that the constraints are violated um, more than epsilon percent of the time, or percent of the instances, I should say, that's more precise. Okay, so it's not necessarily the best thing to do. So there's been a lot of other approaches to, uh, to try to use data to get a better estimate for um, the uncertainty. Uh, the scenario approach uses uh, a finite number of uncertainty scenarios, that's a function of the number of decision variables in the problem, um, to de determine how many scenarios you need to make sure that the constraints hold for. It works well for convex problems, but it usually requires a very large amount of data. Uh, probabilistically robust approaches are basically using a bunch of scenarios as well, but then instead of ensuring that the constraints work for all of the different scenario inst instances, you form a robust set that's determined by those scenarios that you've drawn, um, and then you solve the problem for that robust set. Okay, so you, it's not robust in the sense that you haven't um, ensured that the constraints hold for everything that might arise, like the support of the uncertainty, but it's probabilistically robust because you've drawn a certain number of samples and it's robust for those samples. So that ends up being a little bit more computationally tractable than this one here. Um, and people have applied these techniques to chance constraint optimization problems. I'm citing some work by Maria Recapolo. I'm sure there's other folks that have done this too. My citation list is not fully comprehensive and I apologize if I've missed um, some of your own work here. So this is a common approach that is very data driven. But in order to um, solve problems with these types of approaches, you're looking at having to generate um, tens of thousands, if not more, samples to ensure a probability of constraint violation to be consistent with what you've chosen yourself. And it's hard to get enough samples to be able to do this in practice. Um, the resulting programs, though, are for a DC optimal power flow problem. The, pro the problem is a quadratic program. Um, it's just a very, very, very large one. <laughs> so, so now let's talk about distributionally robust optimization. Okay, so um, distributionally robust optimization is a way to robustify uh, the, 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 the analytical reformulation version of a chance constraint. That's how I think of it. Okay, so I posted a couple of papers online. The first one was actually um, the outputs of a seminar that was held by these folks, Delaj, Kuhn, Natarajan, and Wiseman. So there's uh, just basically like a synthesis of this seminar that they held in, in um, 2018. And the reason I posted this is because it does a really good job of describing the state of the art in the field, um, summarizing some of the, the state of the art presentations that were given at the seminar and talking about open research questions. So even though the paper itself isn't very mathematical, it points to lots of different papers that are, and it gives you an overview of the field. So if you want to do research in this space, I would strongly suggest looking at what they list as open questions, because they directly highlight, like, these are the big things that we're working on now, <laughs> um, and these are the things that are unsolved. So they mention that um, in many, so I'll just read this quote, in many um, practical decision situations, the raw data can be explained by several striking, strikingly different distributions. So what you can imagine here is that you're trying to understand some uncertainty distribution. You take a whole lot of data, and from that data, you can estimate things like the moments, the, the mean, the standard deviation, the covariance, if it's um, multidimensional, and so forth. Um, but that can be consistent with a variety of different um, distributions. So if you assume it's Gaussian, then we're back in the case I talked about before. You can reformulate the problem and you're done. But maybe that data is describing a different distribution, a completely different distribution that just has the same statistical properties. Um, and so distributionally robust um, optimization is trying to allow for that basically to incorporate the fact that the distribution that's generating this data <laughs> uh, isn't necessarily the one that you might assume to start with. So this is a distributionally robust chance constraint. It looks very similar to before. We have the original constraint on the inside and it's the probability um, of this constraint satisfied 1 minus epsilon uh, where the probability is in the set. So this set D um, is an ambiguity set. So that's what they call it, an ambiguity, ambiguity set. So, um, and then this chance constraint has to be satisfied, or this constraint has to be satisfied for all distributions within an ambiguity set. I'll talk a little bit more about what ambiguity sets are. But you should think of it as a set of, of all possible distributions that you want the constraint to hold for. And people have already begun applying distributionally robust optimization to power flow. And here's just some of the papers. There's more that exists as well. Um, and the idea here, again, is that the data 
isn't telling us enough about the actual distribution, where again, actual is in quotes because there is no actual distribution. So instead, we need to be able to represent all distributions that fit the data and be robust against them. So data-driven ambiguity sets. So it's a family of distributions. It could be infinite or finite, um, consistent with the raw data or structural information or some other notion of the data. Okay. There's a variety of ways to construct these ambiguity sets. So I mentioned already that from the data, maybe you've estimated the mean, the covariance, other higher order moments. Um, and you want to make sure that you're robust against all distributions that match that, the mean, the covariance, et cetera. Um, or you could uh, impose a structure on it. You could say, I know this distribution has a certain support, is unimodal, is symmetric, is log concave, or anything, or some subset of these things. Okay? You might know these things because you've observed enough data to have high confidence that these things are true. Um, or you can say that you know that you want to bound the distance between the, dis the empirical distribution and the reference distribution. Uh, and ways to do that include using the Walsh's time metric. And that was mentioned yesterday as well um, by the CEO of Mosaic, who is incorporating a, a method to do that right in the software. So these are different ways to determine an ambiguity set. But again, the idea, you take a bunch of data, you compute statistical properties, and you understand what that data looks like. And you say, our distribution has to be these things, and we want to be robust to any of these distributions that fit into this bucket. Okay. So um, if we consider, so first I'm just going to tell you about some of the, the basic results in this area. So the, one, the simplest way to set this ambiguity set is just to assume that we know the first and second moments. So we've co collected a lot of data, we've computed the mean and the covariance, and we say we want to be re robust for any distribution that has exactly the mean and the covariance that we've calculated from our data set. There's no restrictions on the amount of data, it doesn't, so the scenario based approach I mentioned before, you have to have a certain number of scenarios that you draw to be, to be given guarantees about um, the probability of uh, constraint satisfaction. In this case, I'm not saying anything about how many scenarios you need to use or how many uncertainty samples you need to use to generate these things. But you can imagine if I don't have very many of them, then I probably don't have a high confidence in my estimate of the mean or the covariance, right? So you probably want to use a lot of them if you want to say that we're going to be robust against any distribution with exactly a certain mean and covariance. So this is um, an ambiguity set you could use. Um, and then if you say that your, demand, uh, that your distributionally robust chance constraint is of this form. So I've actually um, specialized it a little juicy, what I've done here, how this is different than the previous ones. Impose a specific structure on it. So here's an arbitrary function of x and c, and here it has to be of this form. So it has to be affine and c. So if you have a constraint that looks like this and it turns out you can reformulate the dc power flow equations with this type of formulation. So basically you have a, a, a more specific uh, constraint you can use of this specific form, um, and you use this ambiguity set here, then you can derive the exact reformulation uh, of this constraint as a second order cone constraint. Okay. So sticking uh, all of your stochastic constraints into this form is something that you'll get practice with in the exercise. So we'll pose a, a DC optimal power flow problem with wind power uncertainty. And you'll see that you can rewrite all the stochastic constraints in this type of form and then reformulate them like this. So this is a key slide for the exercise. If you don't understand the details of it now, it's okay. Actually, we're going to have plenty of time to go over this again. Um, but this is what you'll do. Um, are there any questions on that actually while I'm here? Is it clear what the point is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> An ambiguity set is a set of distributions. So ambiguity is just referring to ambiguity. You have some kind of ambiguity, uncertainty in your problem. So you have a set of distributions. And you're defining that set as all possible distributions that are consistent with the data. Any other fundamental? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering how, like, how difficult is the actual uh, reformulation or the the proof? This, uh, the proof? Yeah. The, how the difficult is the proof? Or is it totally like out of this world, or is it like? Oh no no no! It's not totally out of this world. No no no! You can read it and follow it. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. I'm sorry I didn't give the citation the full citation. I can give that to you easily, but yeah. 
Um, this was done about 10 years ago. And I actually think that this, this exists in a variety of forms in several different publications where they were doing it for different purposes. And they all converged on the same thing. But in the context of distributionally robust optimization, this was done in about 2010. Yeah. Uh, is this method are normally used by the DSO and DSO when they are doing the, or they are just in no. the theory? Oh, sorry. These, the, these methods are only, only in publication or they are really implemented? No, no, somewhere. they're not implemented. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. So they have um, no connection with the reality, what's happening in the grid? Okay, so so two things. <laughs> not yet. Okay, so what the researchers are saying, this is a better way to determine how to dispatch the system and determine the amount of reserves you need to ensure feasibility for your system. So this would be lead to um, solutions with lower cost than, than the current approaches which are just very um, conservative in operating the system. Just conservative. Okay, so this should be less conservative because we're choosing the amount of reserves optimally and the dispatch that's associated with that amount of reserves optimally while still ensuring feasibility at whatever violation level that you're interested in, 99%. Um, you could also ask me something like, well, why 99%? Don't you need to make sure the power grid is there 100% of the time? Um, <laughs> it's true, right? We want to make sure the power grid doesn't go down. So what about that 1%? Do you know? Why like, is why is it okay? Huh? It's expensive. It's more expensive to be completely robust. Yeah. But you also don't want your power grid to go down. And like I mentioned, the system operator's primary goal is reliability, not economics. So why don't they want to just solve a robust problem? Think about what's not modeled here in an optimal power flow problem. I apologize to the folks who don't have a power flow background. Remedial actions, Say it again. Remedial actions, right, exactly. Optimal powerful problems are planning problems that aren't modeling all the corrective actions that the grid can take. So I'm saying 1%, if I say 99% of the time, 99% of instances this has to work, that remaining 1% can still be fine because there's other things that can be, that can fix the problems that arise that aren't being modeled in this problem. So no, it's not being applied, but we're hoping, even if they never want to apply stochastic optimization to dispatch systems, we're hoping this can give us a better idea for the rules of thumb and ad hoc strategies so they can determine the amount of reserves more effectively. Yeah. Yep. How do you define the group of distribution, the state of distribution? Like, is there some side distribution? So you take what data you have. In the data-driven approaches, you take what data you have and you compute what you can from it, statistical properties, et cetera. Um, and then maybe you have some confidence in what you computed. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is, what I mean on the next slide in terms of that confidence. Um, but you, you use what you have from the data and then you characterize the statistics or the distances from known distributions or something in some kind of way. And then you, you just choose what that ambiguity set should look like. And if you want to be very conservative and ensure that you have feasibility, then you aren't too, you don't define that, those distributions very precisely. You define them more generally. And if you want to be more cost effective and you're willing to take a little more risk, then you could use the data to say, I have more certainty in the actual distribution. In the most extreme case, you say, I have absolute certainty that the distribution is this distribution, one distribution. And in the worst case, you say, I have no certainty, so I'm going to solve a fully robust problem. So robust, robust problems, fully robust problems are one extreme. And then knowing the, the one distribution is the other extreme. And distributionally robust can fall anywhere in between. Uh, Two more and then I'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> the difference between large sigma and mu mu transpose? Uh, mu is the mean. It's a vector. Yeah. The difference between uh, sigma, the covariance. And sigma and, is the covariance. But then the sigma is the observed one and mu mu transpose is? Yeah. Uh, is the observed. That's a great question. This is the, they're both observed. The observed mean of the individual uh, random variables, and then the covariance is the observed covariance across uh, between all the different random variables. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you make uh, any assumptions and dependencies between different uncertainty sources, like uh, um, correlation, like time correlation? So, I think that this, this general one doesn't have any assumptions. Um, but I think if you make some assumptions, you can further simplify. Mm -hmm. If you say that they're all independent, then of course things simplify even further. Oh. Yeah, but right now we assume that this covariance matrix could be a full matrix with covariances between the different elements. 
Um, and, and so then there's more complicated ambiguity sets. So this is an ambiguity set where you say I have an empirical mean and an empirical covariance, but I know that they're not particularly accurate. I said I get a mean, but I think that mean is actually somewhere within a ball around that number that I've estimated because maybe I don't have enough samples to have confidence that this is my particular mean. So this is an ambiguity set where you could, um, which has three subparts to it. So the first one is just saying that the integral of the PDF of the uncertainty is one, so it's just normalizing it. Um, and then the second one is an interesting one. It looks a lot like it did before, but we have this additional term gamma one. So the true mean lies in a mu centered ellipsoid bounded by gamma one. So gamma one is like the radius around the mean estimate you have to say that there's uncertainty in that mean estimate up to gamma one. Now how do you choose gamma one? <laughs> so you have some confidence level, but there's various papers, including this one here, Jang and Guab, that talk about based on your data samples and what's, what, you know, what type of um, distributions you're sampling and so forth, how you can make decent choices of gamma one and also gamma two. So gamma two um, is basically saying how far away your co covariance estimate is from the true covariance. So the true covariance matrix lies in a positive semi-definite cone bounded by gamma two to sigma zero. Okay. And if you have this ambiguity set and a nicely structured um, distributionally robust constraint like in the previous slide, then you can reformulate this problem as uh, this constraint as a semi-definite constraint, sorry, semi-definite constraint, and it ends up being a semi-definite program. Okay, so we've tried to apply these types of techniques to optimal power flow problems. Um, so what I, I mentioned that I was um, interested in understanding how aggregations of flexible distributed energy resources can provide reserves to power systems. So this is where we started with this. We said we wanted um, things like air conditioners. I aggregated a thousand air conditioners together. I use them collectively. I control them and I use them collectively to provide frequency regulation to the system. And now I want to determine how much re frequency regulation capacity I should get from the air conditioners versus generators. Okay. But the problem is, if I'm planning in advance for how much frequency regulation capacity you can get from air conditioners, in, in advance, I don't know some things about how many air conditioners I might have available to me. So what's the uncertainty in a problem like that for the air conditioners? Load. Load. You don't know the load. And what's driving the load? Weather. Weather, temperature, humidity, and... Comfortability. Comfortability. People. <laughs> right. People. Right. Exactly. People have different preferences for temperature and it varies over time. So there's all these different uncertainties that interact that affect how many air conditioners I might have available to me on a particular day and how they're operating on that particular day based on ambient conditions. Okay. So there's a lot of uncertainty that affects that. So basically what we said was you can model these air conditioners effectively as a large thermal battery. Um, but the capacity of that thermal battery is uncertain, and it's changing over time as well. Okay, so it's like you have these batteries that exist in the grid that are actually aggregations of small resources, and the batteries are just getting bigger and smaller at different times in the day, and varying at specific times based on what people are doing and what the, how the temperature is changing. Okay, so in that sort of case, if you use that type of reserve to provide backup capacity to the system, what problems could arise? Might not be available for when required. So how would you back up the reserves? Buy a lot more. You could buy a lot more of it, right? So that you have to be conservative. You buy way more than you think you need because it might not be there. You could also back up the reserves of this sort with reserves from generators. So it's like generator reserves backing up load-based reserves, or PER reserves, <laughs> which are backing up the system. And it turns out that the economics can still work out and be a net win for the system if the reserves from the loads are cheap enough compared to the generator reserves, okay? And you can still very effectively utilize these flexible resources in the system. So we were modeling uncertainty in terms of um, wind power forecaster, load forecaster, and the capacities of aggregations of loads to provide reserves. And so the paper that I posted, the second paper, Zang and all, um, is our paper that I posted on, on, on the website that both formulates that model and then solves the problem with a variety of different techniques using distributionally robust optimization. And we were, in this paper, very interested in just exploring if these techniques make sense for this type of problem. 
not saying that they should be used for this type of problem, but do they make sense? And what are the hiccups? What are the problems that you might encounter by using this kind of hiccup technique? So I'm just going to show you some of the results so that you can get a feel for what this looks like. So we've solved a problem on an IEEE 9 bus system. We can dust the lines to make the problem more interested, interesting. And we solved it four different ways. The Gaussian way is not distributionally robust. It says the uncertainty distributions are Gaussian. Solve the problem, but then test the solutions on the real distributions, which aren't Gaussian, to see how well it works. This pr approach is a scenario-based approach. It's actually um, using, drawing a specific number of scenarios to ensure constraint satisfaction at a certain level. So again, this scenario-based approach is champ constraint. It's not distributionally robust. So these two are benchmark cases. Then this is the semi-definite programming reformulation. And this is a second-order cone reformulation of the distributionally robust chance constraint that I just talked about in the previous few slides. So objective cost, um, the first lines are always averages um, across 10 trials. Reliabilities is how, uh, for how many out-of-sample tests do, are the constraints satisfied. So you want the reliability to be high, specifically around 95% or higher. Um, CPU time, how long it takes to solve the problems. And you want the objective cost to be as low as possible to be the cheapest solution that's feasible for the instances that you're interested in. So the cheapest, the cheapest approach is always this approach here, the Gaussian approach. You're saying the distribution is Gaussian, but you know it's not true, so it's not conservative, it's the opposite, right? So it's cheap, but then it doesn't work most of the time. So for only 78% of the instances, were the constraints satisfied when I was trying to get to 95%. Which also tells you that this assumption that the uncertainty is Gaussian isn't a good one. Okay. The scenario-based approach is taking a very large number of scenarios. The cost goes up, um, but so does the reliability. So with this approach, I actually get something that's quite conservative. It's more reliable than I need. I only cared about 95% and I got 99. And so maybe I could somehow drive this cost down a little bit uh, by doing something more intelligent. And importantly, even though it's a quadratic program and has so many constraints, it takes 48 seconds to solve this. The other approaches are all much, much faster. And then the other two reformulations are here. So um, just focusing on the second order cone one, uh, that's the one that you're going to implement. So it ends up being actually more costly than the scenario-based approach, more reliable, but way above what, where we need it to be. So it ends up being even more conservative than a scenario-based approach. But the good thing is it's much, much faster to solve. So basically what you get in this case is a much faster problem to solve at a very high reliability. But what this is pointing to is the fact that uh, we're too conservative. <laughs> These are too robust. Our, uh, our um, ambiguity sets are kind of too big. We want to constrain it further to reduce the number of um, uh, uncertainty distributions that we're going to be robust against because a lot of them are, are not realistic. And so we're getting something that's too costly and more reliable than we care about. Do you have any questions on how to interpret this? Yeah. Or anything else? Yeah. It's fine. I'm wondering about the difference between the lower voltage and the distribution level. And the reliability standards are there versus transmission. And the higher reliability standards are Interesting. Yeah, so in distribution, we're not generally solving optimal powerful problems. So if you're solving another type of optimization problem, in a distribution system, usually our reliability thresholds are lower. We don't, we're okay with power outages on the distribution side, right? Um, but what kinds of problems are we thinking about optimization? Well, if you're looking at the, I mean, the robustness of the distribution system, I'm just, I'm just thinking of this being applied to distribution if I get to an optimal. Yeah. So. We're, <laughs> yeah. We're not. I mean, there are other types of optimization problems, like optimally controlling um, electric vehicles or something. You could do something like this, too. But it, it really depends on how much you care about reliability of your solution, feasibility versus optimality. A lot of the decisions that aren't being made by the... So I can't think of many problems that the distribution system operator solves for operational planning using optimization. Um, they solve problems like for long-term planning sometimes with optimization. But if I think of what's solved in distribution using optimization, it's, it's, it's like coordinating different loads or resources in an optimal way, like electric vehicles. And in that type of case, you don't necessarily care about feasibility as much as just making a lot of money. Um, and so optimality matters more, so maybe you wouldn't want to be distribution robust. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
But then you care about monitoring the distribution power flows, perhaps. You might. Uh, we have another line of work where we're looking at if we control these resources in the distribution system as aggressively as possible, can you cause problems in the distribution? It's actually really hard to because the systems are overbuilt. So it's actually usually a good assumption to ignore the distribution system because you're not going to cause voltage problems or, or transformer overheating or anything like that o often. We can find some special cases where that's not true, and then it makes the problem really fun. <laughs> Jalal, did you have something? Okay. About, uh, about the role of this S item. So yes. you always fix it. Right? You choose it. But can so and it's but it's somehow also models between a uh, like deterministic constraint and unconstrained constraint, right? If it's, if it's zero and one, it would be the two extremes. If it's if it's one then you're robust. You're completely robust, right? I mean kind of saying there's no constraint, right? Yes. And you, you would never go yeah, and no, for one, sorry, uh, for a violation probability of one, then yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But can you see this as a, I mean, are you sometimes also interested in like having kind of this problem formulated as a function of epsilon? So to kind of find out what epsilon should be? Yeah, like, I mean, way, how much yeah. uncertainty you actually have. And the traditional way, so it, it's the chance constraint optimization and distributionally robust optimization assume that that's a design parameter. Yeah. But traditionally what you do when you solve these problems is vary it. Yeah, yeah, that's, solve, and that's then what see I'm... where you're most comfortable being. Yeah. And sometimes when you get solutions, like using the Gaussian approximation approach, super easy to solve, you get a solution, it's not sufficiently robust, you tweak epsilon, you increase it a little bit to get something closer empirically to what you wanted. But then you lose like intuition for the solution and so mm. because you're just playing with it as a, a tuning parameter instead of a design parameter. Mm. So, <laughs> okay, so, uh, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, CPU time aside, uh, how did the cho how did the objective cost for the STP problem change with changing the values of gamma, the ones which were controlling the ellip ellipsoid radius? Uh, great question. How did the CPU time change? No, how yeah. did the objective cost change? Ah, when you make it, so basically when you make this ball around the estimated point bigger, it should increase the cost because you have more uncertainty in the problem. I'm not sure we reported those results ex explicitly in the paper. We just sort of assumed a certain amount based on the data sample, number of data samples that we were drawing. But whenever you make the, the problem, you add more uncertainty to the problem, the cost should increase. Yeah. Did you have something? Yeah. I would like how you define the robustness of the system. Is it a universal parameter, or when you say system is robust, what does it mean? Uh, if the system is robust, so for any uncertainty realization that could possibly happen, there's a feasible solution. That's how I'm defining robustness. There's probably somebody who's like a real optimization problem would have, a person would have like an even more precise definition than that. But that's how what I'm defining this as. Yeah. Um, I was wondering basically for the scenario of, um, for the scenario approach and then the distributionally robust approach, the yeah. generation of the data samples were from the same random number generator. We're not using a random number generator, we're using actual wind power uncertainty samples. Okay. So we have a data set, this one was based on a data set collected from Germany, where we actually have the samples and we're, we're pulling, so we are using random number sampling to pull those yeah. samples in, yes. But we're not generating them from any particular distribution. We're using real data. Okay, and then you use the same data to quantify to reliability with Monte Carlo. Then yes. So we we create uh, the empirical mean estimate and, and a covariance estimate with some of the samples, and then we regenerate samples to do the reliability assessment. So it's out of sample. Okay. Yeah, it's Thanks. out of sample testing. Yeah. I'll take oh. one more, and then we'll move to the next slide. And maybe there was one over here too. Uh, you can go uh, a slide back. Uh, so in the definition of ambiguity set in the last equation, uh, there's a there's no um, lesser or equal, but is it a lesser or equal or uh, this one? Uh huh. Negative uh, semi-definite. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. So the, the resulting program is a semi-definite program. Okay. Thank you. Just one more. <laughs> Everyone's okay? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Do you know if the performance is the same if you have integer decision variables? Oh, or this is only for continuous. This decision? is continuous. Okay. There have been there's been some work on looking at integer, non-convex, etc., but it's very preliminary. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is continuous, and then the constraints are of this nice form. So it means you can extract the uh, uncertainty, and that it's not some not messy nonlinear function of the uncertainty. <laughs> I will move okay. on after you, I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Joanna. So uh, let's compare scenario method and SOCP uh, distribution robust. So yes, in the average, um, the SOCP has a little better reliability. It's 99.53, while the scenario is 99.44. But in the mean, uh, scenario is much better than the SOCP looks at, I mean, even in the reliability perspective, in the worst perspective, scenario works better in this case. Also in objective function, I know that it's not... Wait, which one are you saying? A yeah. scenario and SOCP. Yes. And okay. there, the mean of a scenario, 99.12. That's yeah. min. That's the worst case. Yeah, the mean reliability in the scenario method is much better than the mean of reliability in SOCP, which is surprising. Sure. Right, and even in the case of objective function, the, the distance between mean and max in the scenario is much less than that in the SOCP, and even their mean is almost the same. So if I'm the system operator, I think I will go for scenario based. What it's, it, it's it's less costly it's and it's uh, yeah, it's just the CPU so, time. So, the difference. so for the nine bus system. Yeah, maybe you choose to use this method because it's not a big deal, 45 seconds. Uh, when you scale this, it doesn't scale well. Um, but I agree, and, and I also think that it's system dependent. Uh, yeah. Remember, this isn't just a, like a DCOPF with wind uncertainty like most people are benchmarking against. We have this ext these extra uncertainties because of these aggregations of loads providing reserves. So what's better in terms of objective cost and reliability between the snare approach and that SOCP or STP approach is, is, is based on the system that you're playing. <coughs> So I wouldn't say that it's always in this. And in fact, here, let me show you another one. OK, so this is for you to think a little. Take a look at this. This is the same chart, except I'm using the 39 bus system. Uh, think, just take a second and look at it. Think about what makes sense and what doesn't, <laughs> and what questions you have about the things that don't make sense. Because <laughs> there's some things in here that don't make sense. There's something that, well, I actually kind of gave it away at the end of the slide, but there's something that makes even less sense than that. <laughs> it's system dependent, right? It's not always clear if the scenario approach or this, these types of approaches will be more conservative or less. It depends on the scenarios that are selected here and how bad they are, right? Because <coughs> SOCP and STP, Remember, they're based on the empirical mean and the covariance. The scenario approach, the solution is often driven by the worst case scenario that has been selected. Okay, so it's, it's driven, the answer is driven by a different piece of the data. What? I've seen that a lot with these scenario-based approaches, actually, because you're, you have to draw so many scenarios to guarantee constraint violation at a certain probability with a certain confidence that you are way overly conservative and very close to 100%. We've seen this very commonly. That scenario approach is very, very conservative. I was more surprised that SSCP was as conservative, actually. What else? Do you see anything else that looks weird? <laughs> The CPU times got much higher for scenario and SDP, but the other ones are like still very low. Why is that? So comparing to this one, they all get higher, but this one scales less well, and SDP as well scales less well. It's just that they don't all scale at the same rate to different size systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So should the SDP reformulation be more or less reliable than the SOCP? More. The SDP version has 
uncertainty in the location of the mean and the covariance, whereas the SOCP doesn't have it. It matches it exactly. So it's like the ambiguity set is larger in the STP version. So you're more robust. But then we find that the reliability went way down. Yeah, go ahead. So quick question. Uh -huh. No, we, we use results from the California Campy paper I cited before, which determines the amount of scenarios you should draw. That's a function of the, the number of decision variables in the problem, the confidence, and epsilon. So it's a lot <laughs> of samples. And so you could tune it to decrease it to make that less conservative. Imper but that would be heuristic, yeah. I have a very basic question. Is that from Wait, in the microphone? Reliability is the number of out-of-sample tests. So we solve the problem, and then we test the solution on a bunch of new samples drawn from the, um, the data. So out-of-sample tests. So this is the number of those tests where all the constraints are satisfied. And it's, so it should be whatever we set epsilon to, or 1 minus epsilon to, 95%. So this is too conservative. This isn't good enough. This is too conservative. So let me say here, I, I gave a hint down here, the STP solver is having trouble. So we reported these results. A student came back to me and said, look, we're done. It, it sort of works. SSAP is much better, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> so we went back in and we looked. And we found that in a bunch of instances, the STP solver was converging towards something and then quit. It got stuck because the problem is too big for the STP solver that we were using. And we were using, I shouldn't say what we were using. <laughs> MATLAB with CVX and Mosaic. So, it, but I mean, I think that these things change and there's probably even a better implementation of this problem we could have done as researchers. But in the basic implementation that we use, we kept getting stuck where the SCP solver wasn't working um, to give us a solution. So sometimes we got the solution, sometimes we didn't. When we did get a solution, the solution had a higher reliability than the SSCP as it should. And when we didn't get a solution, we get some suboptimal value out of the solver that wouldn't be reliable. So that's what's going on here. So this is just point of fact that you can use these methods for these problems and learn a lot. Um, but you always have to ask yourself, is this the right tool for this? System operators are probably never going to apply this. But are we getting enough insights from what we're doing to say that this is the right technique to solve this problem? And more importantly, not is this the right technique, but what's the comparison amongst the techniques that exist? And where do we find the trade-offs? I think that's really important in this kind of work. So the paper we wrote isn't like, this is Here's this new method. I'm going to sell it to you. It's so amazing. It's much more like, let's do an exploration and understand limitations of these approaches. That said, in 10 years, these solvers are going to be so much better. Maybe this will be compelling. So I'm not saying you shouldn't work on these topics. <laughs> I'm just saying that you always have to be skeptical. And I find it personally very off-putting when I read papers that are trying to sell me an idea versus explore how that idea works. So you create an idea. You give an honest rundown of its limitations, its benefits, et cetera. And I find that very, very useful in this, in this field especially. So I think we're almost done. So um, in Delage and Yi, they talk about these as the open problems for distributionally robust optimization. I'll let you read the details of the, these things. But these are the things that researchers have not figured out yet. And there's a lot of PhD theses in this. <laughs> so if you're looking for one, there might be something here. Um, this is the same list, and I've broken it out to talk about a little bit about what we're working on or what we've worked on, specifically what my student Bowen has done. Um, we've specifically been looking at the choice of the ambiguity set. Specifically, can we obtain less conservative ambiguity sets so our reliability levels are closer to desired, like 95%, and then the costs are go down by imposing more structure on the distributions. In particular, we've been interested in understanding if we impose structural information to say the distributions must be unimodal, which is a decent assumption for wind power data, so there's one mode. So it looks like that generally, but not necessarily Gaussian. Um, can that reduce the conservativeness? Because you can imagine now, if you have a mean and covariance that could match a distribution that looks like this, it could also match some crazy distribution that looks like this, with lots of modes. But we know uncertainty samples, so this is wind power, not wind power, but wind power forecast error, is probably unimodal, even in a multi-dimensional setting. Um, so we've looked at that, and we've reformulated um, some of these problems such that we get tractable reformulations and we have some papers on that. We've said when we 
uh, impose unimodality, you need to estimate the mode from the data too. Turns out it's much harder to estimate a mode than a mean. So how do you get a mode estimate usually? How do you estimate the mode of data? So the mode, the mode is where the, 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 the mo most of the number itself. So most number of yeah. things fit in that bin, right? So, so usually you would expect the mode of wind forecast error to be around zero if it's unbiased, but it could mm -hmm. be a biased um, sample as well. Okay, so to, to get a mode from data a data set, you do usually you make a histogram, and then you say. The, the most points fit into this bar of the histogram, so the mode is at the center of that bar. So it, it turns out that if you bin the data differently with the different histogram parameters, you get a different estimate, and it can be pretty different. So it's very hard to estimate the mode exactly, but these methods that impose unimodality need an estimate of the mode. So we've also looked at cases where you say it's unimodal, but the mode is misspecified. So you know that the mode is here, but it's within a ball surrounding there. So there's uncertainty in the mode estimate. And we've also looked at um, saying that the distributions have, have uh, are log concave, um, which is kind of very related to unimodality. But um, we've also looked at how can we um, so reformulate the problem in such a way that we can solve it. So you can impose additional structural information and put that in your ambiguity set, and then it's not always clear how to solve the problem in any useful way. So we usually start with an approximate method to try to get an approximate solution, and then we see if we can derive exact reformulations as well and compare them. And in some cases, we found that the exact reformulations, even if they're solvable, are too computationally heavy to be practically useful, and the approximate methods that can achieve the exact um, solution are much faster to solve, even though they might be an iterative method. So we have papers where we looked at the differences between approximations and exact reformulations. Um, but there's a lot of folks just trying to say, impose additional information into the ambiguity set and then say, can you get a reformulation at all? I mean, there's a lot of research on that and that could be papers and dissertations and so forth. And then the last thing that we're looking at, of course, is within the context of optimal power flow or power systems in general, are these the right techniques for these problems? And I think we got at some of that with the question here. For some problems in power systems, you do care about the same things that distributionally robust optimization allows you to care about, specifically feasibility at very high confidence levels. Um, but for other problems in optimization in power systems, you might not care about the same thing. So it's not the right tool for your problems. So just being careful about what to use for what problem. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and we'll take our break and then we'll come back and do the exercise. I think originally on your schedule, there was an hour slot at the end of the day for this too, but it's changed. And so we just have this hour to work on this exercise. Um, this is the first time that the they told me this is the first time they're doing this. So we didn't quite know exactly how much to give you. So let's see if this works in terms of <laughs> if, you, if you, something achievable in an hour. Um, but what we're going to do is implement a distributionally robust version of this problem. So this is DC optimal power flow with wind power uncertainty. This is one of my favorite formulations by Maria Vrecopolo from a few years back. Um, and here's the optimization problem. I'll talk about it in a second. But the goal is to choose uh, the generator set points the reserve capacities for up reserve and down reserve, and what we're calling the participation factors. It's also, some people call it distribution factors. So these are the parameters of a real-time control policy that basically is used to fix forecast error. So every generator has a value, D, um, and will re respond to the total forecast error in proportion to D. Okay, so for instance, you might have a bunch of different resources, and each of them is supposed to respond to 10% of the total forecaster, and there's 10 different resources, and if they all respond to 10% of the total forecaster, then in total they compensate the forecaster. Okay, so this is the, the, what I alluded to earlier, where in addition to determining these first stage variables, generation, um, dispatch levels, and reserve capacities, we're also choosing the parameter of a real-time control policy to respond to forecast error optimally. Um, so the decision variables are up here. And then the random variable we're considering is only wind power forecast error. We're assuming the loads are known. Um, you could add that, but it doesn't complicate it too much. But you have wind power forecast error, which is this W with the tilde on top. Um, and then I'm gonna not go through details just this second. I just wanna show you what the slides contain. So if you have your laptops, now is the time to open them. The slides contain the formulation 
um, a notation list, in case you're unfamiliar with the notation for this type of problem. Um, and then the exercise. So I'm going to describe the exercise, and then we can go back and look at the formulation again. <laughs> so what you'll do is you're going to reformulate this as a distributionally robust optimal powerful problem, assuming known first and second moments. So this is the second order cone programming problem. It's the simpler version, not this semi-definite programming problem. You'll solve it with MATLAB with CVX. Um, and if you have time, you can explore what happens when you change the parameters to get an intuition for how the, the inputs to the problem affect the solution. So what you're given are three files in MATLAB. There's the IEEE 9bus data. This is taken directly from MatPower in case you don't have it on your machine. I'm just, I just included it here. There's this function called case in, which reads in the data from MatPower and puts it into the right form for the code you'll actually play with. So those two you download and then you put them in a folder, the same folder that you're going to work in, but then you don't touch them again. Okay, you don't need to go into the, those. And then the third one is, um, I should say three code implementing most of the optimization problem with comments indicating what is left for you to fill in. So that's called dr underscore moment underscore incomplete. I'll share with you the dr underscore moment complete later. <laughs> but there's about 10 lines of code you have to write to make this work. But in order to write those lines of code, you have to understand the optimization problem and the existing code. Um, but the code I've highly commented, so it should be somewhat clear. And there's an example in the code of some of the second order cone constraints already included for you. So you can see the pattern, essentially. If you can do pattern recognition, you probably could implement this without really understanding what's going on. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, but <laughs> but uh, you have to reformulate about six, maybe four types of constraints yourself, okay, and implement them. So again, you're only modifying dr underscore moment underscore incomplete dot m, and you run only that program, and it calls the other ones. Okay, so that's the only one you really need to open and get yourself into. So you should download those files. Um, let me try to get out of here for a second. So when I open MATLAB, I have in my MATLAB folder, I have CVX. Or you can just add CVX to your path because the function includes calls to CVX to solve the second order cone program. Um, case nine, case in, and DR moment incomplete. Uh, and then if you open DR moment incomplete, uh, there's the function that you can run. And you'll see I'm pulling in the data. I'm setting up all the matrices. I um, also, in this code, I'm just setting the wind forecast and the, the, the moments directly. I'm not computing it directly from data, but this part here, wind forecast and error. If you wanted to implement this in practice with the real data set, this is where you would be computing the mean and the covariance with the real data. Okay, but here I'm just saying this is what it is for this problem. Uh, and then the optimization problem starts. Here are the constraints I've already coded. And then there's this line here that says the remaining SOC constraints need to be added here. And that's what you're doing. And again, it's about I think 10 to 15 lines of code that you'll need to write to get this all to work. So you can actually run the program now. It works. It, well, it works in some sense. It'll give you a solution, but the constraints, some constraints are missing, so the solution doesn't make sense. So it might make sense for you to run it first and see why the solution doesn't make sense so that you know what you're aiming for in terms of the solution that does make sense. Um, and I will share the full solution with you at the end. So going back, just a few more words from me. So in the slides, which are posted, there's uh, the last slide, slide 19, includes steps that you should follow. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is work in groups because I think it would be really beneficial for you to talk to somebody about this. Um, and also there's a few folks in the room who don't have MATLAB on their laptops because the, they don't have licenses. Okay, so if you, if you could sort of take some of those folks in and work with them and help them, that would be great. Um, and then here's the procedure I'm suggesting you follow. It's a logical way of understanding how to do this, okay? I don't want you to just start hacking in the code because then you won't get a fundamental <laughs> understanding of what's going on. Okay, so that's, that's the description here. And you'll see that the first step is to familiarize yourself with the, this problem. Okay, so this is the problem that you're implementing so let's be quiet just a little bit longer. Quiet just a little bit longer. Shh. 
OK, so here's the optimization problem. And I'm going to just run through it real quick. But I want the first step that you should do is to talk to your team to make sure you understand it so that you know what you're coding and implementing. Um, so you're minimizing the cost of generation. Those are the first two terms of the objective function plus the cost of reserves. Subject to, the first one is um, the line limits. So PL is the limit on the lines. P injection um, is the injections at all the buses and the A matrix maps the injections to the line flows. So those are the line flow limits. The next uh, P injection is just computing the injections at all the buses. Um, and that's the injections with the reserve actions R. And then the next one, R, uh, is what's computing the reserve action. So based on the total wind power forecast error, um, uh, omega tilde, um, every resource responds with a certain amount, a certain, by a certain percentage d, <laughs> to the total wind forecast error. So all of these are vectors. R is a vector, d is a, dg is a vector, and so forth. Um, and then the next constraint, the one that starts with pg under bar, is um, constraining uh, the generator actions, and then we're constraining the reserve actions, and then we're normalizing this participation factor DG to make sure that if all the resources respond according to this um, control policy parameter, that they in total make up the total response needed for the system. Um, and then the, the third to last constraint, the one that starts with one underscore um, one by NB. That one's just saying that there has to be power balance for the forecast, the wind power forecast. And then we're just making sure all of these different variables are greater than zero. And again, the next slide includes the notation description that I just went through. Yes. DG. So that's something you're choosing, the participation factor. It's a decision variable, which is the parameter of the real time policy for the response of each of the generators to forecaster. This is not uh, traditional in, in OPF, but it's traditional, it's become traditional in chance constraint OPF. <laughs> so I appreciate not everybody has the same background. So uh, start with going through this, uh, understanding the problem, and talking with your teammates about the problem formulation. And I'm going to just be wandering around if you have questions, OK? So let's just use the next 45 minutes and see how far we all get. And at the end, we'll come back and talk about the solution. What, I'm, what I was planning to do um, was discuss the solutions that you obtained and then post my solution, which is the code. Um, since we don't have a solution yet and we don't have time this afternoon to, to finish this, um, what I'm going to do uh, is not post anything until somebody shows me a working solution, because <laughs> I want to see if you can get it from what I've given. It'll also give us good feedback as to if this is the right type of problem and the right content for the class. Um, but uh, before the end of the summer school, I'll post the solution. Um, so you can play around with it, and you should be able to see from the code how to do these calculations uh, and get everything in the right form. Um, and I've also, uh, a student suggested I also post the reformulations. So it's much more clear what A and B are for each type of constraint, things like that. So I need to generate that. I don't have it yet, but I'm happy to do that. Um, but I first want to give you some time to finish it yourself, because I think you'll learn more by doing it yourself than seeing my solution. <laughs> and I think a lot of you got very far. You're almost there. You just need a little time to sort of work out the details and code it. And there should be a half an hour right after lunch. Oh, OK. But, uh, to do a little more? OK. There's a half an hour? Yeah. OK, if people want to keep working on it. But it sounds like, in general, this is useful. There just wasn't enough time to get to the end. Is that kind of your feeling? OK, <laughs> good. And if, you, if there's something you find would be particularly useful for me to include in the solution, just to make it abundantly clear how everything works, let me know. But um, I can give you as much detail there as you need. OK, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You're, you're trying the activity, I mean? <laughs> yeah. Piece of numerical solution so we can see you know, before posting or sending you any coded solution that it's right. So we have uh, the feedback. If it's right? Like it's, uh, so you, we, you don't have to parse through a million RAM solutions or we do like. Uh, Okay, so here's my code. I just did, I'm not going to keep this up for very long, but you can kind of see. Hold on. No, no, no. I, I'll explain something. So. What I want you to do, basically, what you need to do is implement these other two blocks for the reserve limits, which are stochastic, and the line limits. And you're just determining the A's and B's. 
Um, so I'm not going to, I'm going to hide that now. And then <laughs> I'm going to run the code and give you the answer numerically so that you know numerically what you're aiming for. But then you need to show me the optimal decision variables, and that's how I'll check if it's right. So you're just going to get the optimal cost, OK? Four six nine four point eight two. <laughs> Maybe they're not constraining for this case, but I'd still implement them and double check that. <laughs> yeah, but your decision variables might not. Uh, they should probably still be consistent. But you can find cases where the line flows will be constraining. And in this case, maybe you don't have any line flow constraints. There's no congestion. So it's still meaningful. It doesn't mean you have the full solution, though.